Welcome to the district. I'm your host, Aaron Miller. I'm here in the fly loft in the Brady Arts District. Today, we're gonna to talk to David Carter and Ron Pradle of the Tulsa Symphony. The Tulsa Symphony offers many educational programs, young people's concerts, workshops in schools, and much more. Today, we'll talk to David Carter, the Symphony's Education Director, about all these exciting events. How are you doing, David? Doing all right. Excellent. Well, I think we'll start with a tough, tough question. Okay. What is your role at the Tulsa Symphony? <laughs> uh, I'm one of the Tulsa Symphony executive musicians. So uh, in our model, uh, musicians help lead and run the organization. So as an executive musician, I'm the principal clarinetist in the orchestra and the education director in the office during the day. Excellent. Is that common that the musicians also serve in administrative functions in a symphony? We're a unique model. Uh, there are models that are, there are orchestras that are moving in that direction, uh, in Europe in particular. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're kind, of, we're kind of at the front of that, of that effort. Excellent. So tell us how you, you know, became a clarinetist and what led you to this point here in Tulsa? Oh, uh, let's see. I, honestly, I became clarinetist uh, in the fifth grade <laughs> uh, because my grandpa loved Woody Herman. And so I would huh. drive around Omaha, Nebraska with him listening to Woody Herman. And my grandpa seemed like a pretty cool guy. So <laughs> I picked the clarinet and then I just started playing it and, and uh, did a lot of saxophone playing. And, and one thing led to another and went to school. and. Uh, Ended up here because uh, I did a doctorate at the University of Oklahoma, and when I was there, that's about the same time that the Tulsa Symphony started. So I came up and played with the opera, and uh, then they gradually started to use me in the symphony orchestra, and then uh, auditioned. They had an opening, and I auditioned and won the spot, and kind of it all <laughs> turned out from there. Excellent. So how how do you balance uh, you know your music side with your education director and, and administrative side? Um, uh, hopefully effectively <laughs> at times. Uh, I, I, it works well, you know, you, the two are, are not as, as disparate as they sometimes seem. Um, I've been in this position for a little over a year now and of course there was some trepidation about that. Um, but it actually works quite well. Um, you can't practice from hmm. 8 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock at night. That, Why is that? That physically doesn't <laughs> work. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so actually um, as long as you can kind of see it all as one piece, then it can all it can all tie together uh, quite well. Actually, I come from um, from doing higher degrees. I come from a background in, in academia, so I was teaching uh, at a university. And really, at the university, you're you're not playing all long all day long. You're kind of slipping playing in wherever you can, and uh, and working on your craft that way. And then you're teaching, and then you're also doing all sorts of um, administrative. Uh, responsibilities. So it actually uh, it was, was kind of a, a natural fit to come over. It's, it's a different set of challenges, but it's, it's really fun. Um, and of course, to be uh, working administratively for an organization that you really, really are tied to and care about the success of in a community that you love, well, that, that's a huge difference. So uh, it's, it, it's very supportive. That's great. So tell us a little bit about your role as the education director. What are some of the programs that you oversee Okay. Uh, well, I, I, we, everything that we do educationally, obviously, um, uh, falls under my responsibility. Um, and uh, we're, 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 our, our education programs are evolving, but we've, uh, we've done some, some careful planning a little over a year ago. And uh, what we're focusing on now are programs that provide the live orchestral experience for kids, usually focusing on the very young. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, after that, then we, then we work on more hands-on experience of actually teaching music education. So um, what we're calling our young person's concerts are kind of the, the bulk of our effort right now. Um, we have, uh, this will be our third year with the Any Given Child Tulsa Initiative. And so all Tulsa Public Schools um, students come to a live concert downtown at the PAC. They get the whole experience of the big hall. And we do a program that specifically ties into their social studies curriculum. Um, and so that's, that's one of our big concerts. We have another partnership now with Carnegie Hall. It's called Carnegie Hall Link Up. And that, as it grows, will serve uh, hopefully all uh, Tulsa Public Schools and actually out, out of the region, in the region as well, um, third graders, fourth graders, and fifth graders. And that's a program where uh, the students uh, 
well, it's a, there's, there's three pieces to the program. Uh, we just had the professional development for the teachers. That's the first piece. So they came here to the fly loft. Uh, oh, good. Uh, yeah, so it was cool, and they get to see it. And of course, they, they're not down here all the time, so uh, I think it's fun for them. But uh, we had three lead teachers and myself leading the teachers on this curriculum that Carnegie Hall has spent 30 years developing. And uh, what they're going to do now is take it to the second piece, which is teach the kids this curriculum, which is all this repertoire that they learn to sing, they learn it on recorder, or they can do it on violin if they have a strings program. Um, and then there are all these extensions that they, they learn about music making, they learn about proper singing, they learn about the composers, they learn about how it's related to math. There's, it's, it's a huge book. It's really neat. And, and then the last piece is in February, they're going to meet us at Lorton Performing Arts Center, and we are going to play a concert, and they're going to sit in the hall and they're going to play along with us. Wow. <laughs> so it starts them very young getting that live orchestral experience. And if you see it, it's, it's got all these visuals, and there's a, it's, there's a full script, and there's actors, and it's a it's very entertaining thing. So we're pretty, we're pretty excited about that. So those are the kind of the two big pieces we're working on. But then we also um, have started a family concerts um, that we're going to bring in annual uh, to uh, that, that used to be a tradition here in Tulsa and a lot of people from the time that I started as education director said what happened to those concerts and, uh, and it's something that we've we've kind of been playing around with and now we're actually going to launch it uh, this fall and make it an annual thing so there will be different family concerts every year. So. Great. So has it been a struggle for you to convince the education institutions in Tulsa that music education is very important um, or have they been really willing to jump in right away? I w consistently, um, mu music people are particularly excited about, I find, but maybe that's my bias, I don't know. Uh, but uh, yeah, you, I, you would almost wonder if there would be some resistance because you know we hear so much about testing and oh, they gotta, they gotta do this, I don't have time for that, I don't have time for that. But across the board, consistently, everybody is excited and they wanna see ways to get the arts into their classrooms. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's an important piece, and, and I thought I was going to spend most of my time convincing people how important it is, and I don't spend any time at all doing that. The only thing that, that limits us is time and money. Mm -hmm. um, so really, uh, we, we've got great programs going, and now it's a matter of getting out there and making sure that there's support for those programs um, to, to be put in front of the kids. So what is your pitch on the importance of, of music education, especially for elementary kids? You know, anecdotally, we knew for years uh, Again, with bias, I'm a musician, but uh, so we knew anecdotally that, that something happens developmentally with children when they're involved with the arts, and actually specifically with music, and I, and I think that relates to the fine motor skills, but it's not anecdotal anymore. Now we've got 10, 15, 20 years of, of real research coming out of very important institutions that show that children who are involved in a music program from a young age develop differently. They develop different social skills, their cognitive skills are different, and uh, their ability to comprehend language and hear is drastically improved. Um, and, and really, even just five years ago, we were having to sell that really hard. But now people are aware of it. Like I was saying before, they're, they're aware of it, and they want it in, in their environment for their children. And so uh, it's an exciting time, because now we're just kind of waiting to see how we, can, how we can put the right pieces together to get in front of everybody. Excellent. And have you seen the strings programs in the Tulsa area um, start to expand? Or, or is the Tulsa Symphony invested in the expansion of youth music education um, from the skills standpoint rather than just the awareness standpoint? From actually hands-on performance? Mm -hmm. It is, it is. Uh, like the, the first thing that we're focusing on is providing a live or orchestral experience for those students. And then right after that we get into the more hands-on things and then uh, coaching and then private teaching and, and uh, performance experience um, as that goes along. Um, I think that that's a practicality on one end because you're going to be able to impact more lives um, unless you can buy a violin for everyone, I suppose. <laughs> um, the thing about this Link Up partnership is so great is they're actually doing both. They're having the live orchestral experience and they're playing and mm -hmm. they're singing. So they're, they're kind of getting, they're getting it from all these different angles that, that, that uh, should have a lasting impression. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question. No, that's that's <laughs> but, great. But uh, yeah. So, you know, if you're looking at students and trying to, you know, inspire them uh, to pursue a career in music, mm -hmm. what does that take? You know, you said you started playing the clarinet in fifth grade. Mm -hmm. Where were all the different inflection points where you could have, you know, lessened your commitment to music where you chose to take kind of the next step? Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, that's for, it, it's probably different for everyone, but for me personally, uh, I, from the time I started playing, I knew that I wanted to do something, and I can remember very early on saying I want to play an orchestra before I ever had any idea what that meant. Hmm. Um, uh, so, so uh, certainly I was distracted by skateboarding, and 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 I, I run a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so little hobbies come in and, and come out. But I have consistently pursued music for myself. That's not the way it happens for for everyone, and some people start much younger and want to stick with it. Um, What's important to, to emphasize is that I don't feel an obligation and we don't feel an obligation to turn everybody into professional musicians. That's not practical and also mm -hmm. we, we need really good doctors and, <laughs> and, and, and whatever else. Uh, so so I, I, don't, I don't think that that's the point of it. What we love about training students musically from early on, of course, is the, the enjoyment they get out of it, mm -hmm. um, but also the social benefit and the other developmental benefits that they get from it. Um, you know, one, one of our, our great supporters and a great friend of mine is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a pulmonologist. He's a great doctor, and he's a clarinet player, and he's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and he goes and he plays all the time, but that's not what he does for a living. Mm -hmm. So I, I think stories like that, which are all around, are, are really, really important. It's, a, it's a, an activity for people to be engaged in that keeps them sharp and keeps them motivated and, and inspired. Where do you see opportunities for growth in what the Tulsa Symphony can do with education? Uh, certainly we, we have a great partnership with the Tulsa Public Schools and uh, Union Public Schools and, and, and some, some other school districts in the area, San Springs and Jenks, um, as we can um, show more and more, I mean we're 10 years old, so as we can show more and more that we are committed as an advocate for the arts for them and that we're supporting the schools, I think there's lots of uh, growth we can do uh, within the school districts where we're already active, but also um, throughout the region. Um, uh, right now we have some great programs that we want to bring to other people. Um, we, we've sort of have a, a fairly full roster going of programs and now it's a matter of showing people that, that, that really it's a, of great benefit and fun <laughs> for those students to be a part of it. And then of course there's always the, the limit of resources. So you, uh, we can do it time-wise I think on our end, but the, the, the schools are they're really, really, really busy and they have a million things. Uh, and of course everything costs money. But. Right. So if, if you take off your uh, education director hat mm -hmm. and you, you put back on your musician hat, mm -hmm. um, what do you and the fellow members of the orchestra get out of these educational experiences? Well, I mean, the, the, <laughs> I, I, everybody always says with the look on their face, but it's so true, <laughs> you know, that's one of those things that people say and then you don't. You're not sure about it, and then you experience it, and you're like, oh, that's the one there. Okay, yeah, that is pretty cool. So, I, I mean, they, they're really genuinely psyched. And uh, so, so that, it's just very rewarding in that way. Um, for me as a musician, I love when we create connections to other things that they're doing. And I will say other things that they're studying. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many great teachers in the area that do such a good job of not making it studying. The kids are involved in, in projects and in project thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and so somehow to me that's a little different than studying and, and music seems to really support and piggyback on that as well because you're, it's participatory. And so I love it when I see students make connections between, uh, between different skills. When you, when you can see someone who thinks a little more mathematically and for them that helps develop skills musically or, or scientifically even. They're problem solving with their instrument, you know. Um, so I, I, I like to I like to witness those things go down. That's great. I would imagine that you know it can be a grind sometimes preparing for a show um, and for the musicians to have that opportunity to see that childlike wonder again can kind of remind them why they you know pursued this in the first place and, and why it's so inspiring to other people. Absolutely. And you know they don't they don't bring all of that preparation baggage with them. They're just having a good time. Mm -hmm. And so when they're screaming and yelling <laughs> and and it's just it's it's uh, it's uh, it's a natural reaction, and that really reinforces like yeah, this has a very uh, a real impact on people. That's great. Yeah. So um, what is exciting to you about being in the Tulsa Symphony specifically? To to have a say in how things go. I mean, um, whether you're uh, in the office working or not, everybody is serving on committees and making decisions about what we play, about who conducts us, about where we play. Um, everybody has some some input there, and so that's that's really exciting. And and honestly, I have a, I have a family. We love Tulsa, so that you know those pieces together is pretty ideal. Great. Mm -hmm.
Well, David, thank you so much. Appreciate your time today, and it sounds like you're doing great work for the Tulsa community. We're having a good time. Excellent. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, we'll talk with the executive director of the Tulsa Symphony, Ron Pradle. Stay tuned. This is one amazing truffle tree. Can you imagine a place where these grow everywhere? Yes, it's called the forest. A magical place to enjoy with your family. So discover the forest and explore all the wonder that's there. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. Founded in 2005 on a unique concept of orchestral governance, the Tulsa Symphony garnered national attention for its non-traditional structure. Today we'll talk to Ron Pradle, Executive Director of the Tulsa Symphony, on their treasured history and what's coming next. Ron, great to see you. Good to be here. How are you today? I'm doing great. Excellent. Uh, so tell us a little bit about what it means to be the Executive Director of a symphony. Well, this is an executive, uh, executive director position that's different from most symphonies uh, in that we have a much different kind of structure. So in, I'm very much kind of a facilitator rather than strictly an administrator because mm -hmm. the organization is run by uh, uh, 12 different committees, actually. And so it's up to me to be the uh, facilitator for those, sometimes the referee, uh, and to keep all those wheels turning and to keep all the communication going between those various parts of the structure to keep the whole organization moving. So how long have you been with the Tulsa Symphony? This is my, uh, I came out in the third season and now of course we're in the 10th. So I've okay. been with them eight seasons and a uh, lot has changed. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what those changes have looked like. Well, uh, our season has expanded. That's, that's one thing. Uh, we are uh, an orchestra that's dedicated to community service and we are much more involved now as uh, in community engagement uh, uh, than we were at that time. I mean, everything was just beginning, and we were planting many, many seeds in the community, uh, musically, educationally, and just in, in engagement activities. And over the past eight years, all those seeds have begun to grow, and, um, and what we, our, our service reaches an impact which is much more out into the community than it did at that time because we're just really getting everything going. Staff has changed a great deal, staff has grown. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our ambitions as a musician-led orchestra, one of our aspirations, was to involve as many musicians as, we, as were qualified as we possibly could on our orchestra staff. So our original orchestra staff was about eight, I think when I came on board, seven or eight, uh, with only a few musicians involved. We now have a staff of 11, and eight of those, um, seven of those are musicians, and five of those seven are full-time positions, and we're very, very proud of that. That's so great. we have these dual appointments, we refer to them as executive musicians, so they're working in the office by day, and they're on stage by night, which is a tough assignment. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're talented people, they're bright, and uh, they're able to pull it off. So seven years ago, what drew you to Tulsa as a, a community and to the Tulsa Symphony as an organization? Well, I put down roots here. I came here in 1966, and I was on the faculty at the University of Tulsa, where I was, uh, uh, I probably had just about every job, or uh, every position on the music faculty over a period of 40 years. Uh, in my final three years at the university, I'd been director of the School of Music, uh, director of bands, I started the jazz program, the wind ensemble program, uh, taught theory, trumpet professor, I mean, just about everything. It was, it was almost like I was changing positions, but I never had to sell my house and leave Tulsa. Right. You know, I mean, things kept happening for me at the university. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. But then after 40 years, in uh, 2006, I retired from TU. And um, as people say around the office, I flunked my retirement. <laughs> so at that time, they were uh, doing a national search for an executive director for the orchestra. And of course, I knew that whole family already. I mean, I'd, as the director of the School of Music, I had hired adjunct professors from the symphony to teach uh, instrumental music, and the various instruments. And so I knew not only the musicians, but I knew the board members and so forth, uh, uh, who were all very much involved in the artistic community in Tulsa. And so mm -hmm. many of them were friends. And one good friend in particular, who was also uh, on the faculty at TU, um, and she retired recently, uh, just looked at me, looked me in the eye and said, 
enough of this retirement thing. You're done. You've, <laughs> you've done that. Now come, come work with us. And so they did a national sh search, and I went through the process along with the other candidates, and here I am. That's great. Uh, and and what, has been, what have been some of the major changes you've instituted um, and been proud to see over the last couple of years? Well, the one I mentioned, the yep. fact that we've been able to integrate musicians into the staff. We've been able to, uh, we kind of refer to the symphony as being a three-legged stool. And of course, with any good three-legged stool, all three legs have to be healthy and strong. And if any one of them is not, then you've got a real problem. Um, and so uh, we really set that um, according to our mission to, to emphasize always the artistic and professional excellence, artistic excellence of the orchestra. Secondly, we know that education outreach is vital to our mission and, and to the service we can provide uh, in the community. And then community engagement as well. And uh, those three legs of that stool uh, had really begun to take shape in the last seven years. Do you feel that the, the structure of having musicians in the administrative side of the orchestra has attracted better talent to the Tulsa Symphony? Yes, yes it has. We've had people relocate uh, from other parts of the country. Uh, in some cases they, they were commuting, playing some of our performances. Then they found that there was uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, opportunity in Tulsa uh, for performance, mm -hmm. and so they actually have relocated to play in the orchestra. We've had the same thing happen on the staff. People that were commuting found opportunity on the staff, and, um, and they were the right people, and I, I want to emphasize they're qualified people. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a pretty amazing uh, pool of musicians in terms of their backgrounds, their education, their talent, their creativity. It's a very talented group of people, and, um, and people with amazing potential. Uh, and putting them in, in positions, I mean, they're also invested in the orchestra, which mm -hmm. is number one. You know, they want to see this work, they want to be a part of its success, and uh, so you put all those things together, a talented pool and, and a dedication and commitment to the organization, and you've got an awfully good combination. What's the inside story of how Tulsa came to adopt this model of orchestra? Yeah, well, you know, um, as, we, as we're in this, um, two year where we've actually turned our uh, celebration, our 10th anniversary into kind of stretch it over two years. And that's because the orchestra itself was formed over two years. Uh, our first performance was in February 2006, but the orchestra was actually founded in October of 2005. And then the first full season was the 6-7 season. Mm -hmm. So we're stretching the celebration over, over a couple of seasons. But when, when you really look back to Tulsa, which we've been doing, it's been incredibly interesting to look back uh, on, the, on the history of Tulsa and the arts in Tulsa. And um, going way back to 1904, you know, when the streets were dirt and mud and the buildings were all just kind of, they didn't look like much and they didn't <laughs> look, look like they were very substantial, just wooden buildings up and down these streets with horses going up and down the streets. The first arts organization in Tulsa was a, a musical society called Haichka, hmm. which is the Creek Nation word for music. So these people got together, as I understand it, on the second floor of one of these kind of ramshackle buildings and said, you know, we need to bring, 1904, we, culture is going to be very important, and music in particular is going to be very important to the city. And we're here to say that, and we're here to do something about that. And they did. And in 1911, they brought the uh, New York Orchestra here, which of course was later the New York Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. So in 1911, the first orchestra performance in Tulsa was the uh, predecessor of the New York Philharmonic. So there was a real commitment there. So if you kind of fast forward from that to uh, 1948 and the formation of the Tulsa Philharmonic Orchestra, which then continued, uh, it had a great presence in Tulsa and was really a, a, an institution and became a tradition. And then unfortunately they fell upon some bad times organizationally and financially. And finally in 2002, they discontinued performances. They still continued as a society, but they were no longer presenting. Hmm. And that left a huge gap. Uh, this, uh, the community had become very accustomed to having a very fine professional orchestra. And you, know, you don't know what you got until you lose it, right? <laughs> and so in 2005, uh, uh, a retired neuro neurosurgeon, uh, whose name is Dr. Frank Letcher, still here, still a patron of the arts, uh, said, you know, this has gone on long enough. 
So we need to put something together, but we want to avoid the problems that the Philharmonic has had in the past. And some of those problems were, in fact, uh, differences that arose between the musicians and the board. So one way to solve that was have a board with musicians on it. And, it, and that's when it all began. If we can have the musicians' investment in this orchestra, and we refer to it as musician-led, then we're going, to evolve, uh, we're going to avoid a lot of the conflicts that the other orchestra had. And so let's kind of build an orchestra that fits this community, that fits what they want artistically, but also fits what they need structurally to be a success. And voila, we have the Tulsa Symphony. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. It is. It really is. And there, are, there isn't another orchestra exactly like this anywhere. I mean, there are other musician-led orchestras. They have various structures. But especially if, once you take yourself away from the traditional structure of, you know, board, executive director, uh, artistic director, mm -hmm. resident conductor, once you go away from there, you are really customizing a structure according to your community's needs and, and, and their, um, their ambitions. And that's what's happened here. So as you look at other, and there are only a few, musician-led orchestras across the country, they're all a little bit different. They're all a little bit tweaked you know, in, in, a, in a very special way that, uh, to accommodate their com the community. And that's what's happened here. So what have been some of the struggles that the Tulsa Symphony has faced uh, over the last 10 years? Has it been more in audience development? Has it been in sourcing talent? Um, what are the things that you've had to overcome to reach this amazing milestone? Well, um, uh, talent is always a challenge. I mean, uh, if you want the very best musicians you can possibly have. And with the demise of the Philharmonic, many of those really fine musicians left Tulsa. Now, there were quite a few wonderful musicians who, who did stay, and that was very fortunate for this organization because without those players, and, and many of them are still in the orchestra, it could have never started over. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a challenge, bringing those people back, bringing that talent back, or getting new talent. Uh, back to the organization. And then just no role model, no mentor. Where mm -hmm. do we go? You know, who do we look to when we run up against a problem or a decision we have to make or, you know, which road do we take? Well, you, we couldn't look down, you know, to the next state or the next uh, 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 orchestra. We couldn't look to Kansas City. We couldn't look to Oklahoma City. We couldn't look to Dallas. They were all the traditional structure. So we had to kind of figure it out on our own. And when you have to figure it out on your own, you know, you're sort of in a maze, and every once in a while you're going to get to one of those, one of those uh, ways right. out that is no way out at all. So, <laughs> you know, some of it's trial and error, uh, and we have learned, and we learned very quickly, that communication is key when you have these, when you have committees and groups of people making decisions rather than one individual. I mean, a good example of that is programming. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're in a traditional structure, you have an artistic director. The artistic director sits down with his vast experience and he puts down the programs for the next three seasons and a week later you print the, you print the brochure and you're off and running. Well, we have a committee of 12, mm -hmm. several board members who are very well versed, and then the rest are musicians. And we bring all their collective histories, musical histories together uh, to devise our season. Well, it, we can't do that in a week. The, the committee meets uh, diligently every week. Uh, and a huge commitment, and these are all volunteers. So, oh. And I think that's another aspect of the organization. If you don't have that commitment, if you don't have that dedication, then you're not going to have people willing to volunteer their time for the good of the organization. And so many of these musicians do that. They sit on these committees, they make it work. Now, we've got something brand new this year, hmm. which is a principal guest conductor. Yet, the artistic director, as such, is still the committee. Now, the principal guest conductor was wonderful, Daniel Heggie. Uh, has vast experience and he's a perfect fit for this orchestra because he comes to us as another musician. He's the person who's on the podium mm -hmm. and he sits down with the artistic committee and he discusses with them the possibilities that they've been discussing and they can bounce things off one another. So it's an entirely different kind of relationship with our principal guest conductor than you would find in a traditional uh, relationship where the artistic director, resident conductor is in fact calling all the shots. Here, he's a member of the team. Well, it's amazing to see some of the entrepreneurial uh, 
tasks that you've gone out and achieved, and, and I'm curious what's coming up on the horizon for the Tulsa Symphony? Well, you know, for one thing, we think that's why we're such a good fit for this Brady district. <laughs> but we really do. We think structurally, you know, there, there's so many creative people around here, and they're not just creative thinkers, they're creative doers. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the kind of an organization that we have as well. So we feel so comfortable here, and we feel so fortunate to be in the, in the middle of this whole um, uh, really kind of rebirth. Uh, and so many wonderful things are happening, so many new things, and we feel like we, we fit into that. Uh, creatively and also also structurally. We, we think of ourselves as thinkers as well as doers. Uh, as far as what's coming up that's new, um, we're always trying to reach more diverse audiences. We're trying to bring in younger audiences. Uh, we're trying to, uh, with our educational program, appeal to families. We're doing a pilot uh, family program this year uh, with Bruce, Ad Bruce Adolph. I don't know if you know of him. He's uh, NPR, the piano puzzler. Mm. Uh, great guy, great composer. <laughs> He's going to be here for a weekend, and that's a that's a joint collaboration between the Center, uh, Oklahoma Center for the Humanities at TU, and the orchestra, and then Philbrook. Great. So, and that's another aspect of this orchestra. We are all about collaboration. Any mm -hmm. place we can bring, uh, involve other uh, other organizations or or other resources in the community to draw their network into ours, and vice versa. We're all about that. So that's one aspect of it, we're, we're this pilot project. We're also very involved uh, with the new Carnegie Hall link-up program for students, Any Given Child. Uh, that's, that's really exciting. And then as far as our regular season is concerned, at the PAC, we, for the first time, have a pop series, which uh, this year is going to be a Halloween concert. Everyone's in costume, or we're hoping everyone's in costume. <laughs> and uh, that, we're calling that our spooktacular. Uh, we also just happened to get an uh, early December date, which normally doesn't happen to us. Uh, and so for the first time, we're going to present uh, a holiday concert as a part of that pop series. And then we, probably the most popular program we have every year uh, is, is a live soundtrack to a movie. And so we're doing that as a third piece of the pop series. So That's that'll be a wonderful finale to that. Uh, a couple years ago, we did a simulcast with Cox uh, to the Guthrie Green, which you know we're, we're beginning to refer to as our outdoor venue, our outdoor <laughs> home, and we love it because it's so convenient. So we just push the instruments down the down the ramp, and, and uh, an hour later we're in business. Uh, and we actually simulcasted a concert from the PAC, a regular PAC classics concert, to the Guthrie Green, so that people, because of children, because mm -hmm. of expense, of buying a ticket, and so forth could have the experience of that concert outside with the sound and with the video and be in a very casual atmosphere. Uh, and they could come and go as they please, and if they would rather run through the fountains and listen to the number, they can do that as well. So we want to try to continue that as much as we can. Uh, a lot depends on weather, when the last concert is, because right. if the, sun is, is, uh, the sunset is too late, then of course you can't view the video. So there, there are a lot of complications with that, but that's another service to the community that we want to continue. We love doing, opening our season outside on the Guthrie Green during that first weekend and, mm -hmm. and Friday, and we get amazing crowds, and the people look forward to that all year long, and we get comments about it all year long. So we want to continue doing those things. Tell us about, you know, when you are performing outside of Guthrie Green, and there are the fireworks and the skyline yeah. in the background, um, how do you approach choosing the music differently for an outdoor venue that's more broad and open to the public than you do for um, a venue like the PAC? Yeah, well, there are, there are a number of considerations. One, of course, is, and the first consideration is always the audience. You know, mm -hmm. Who's going to be there? Who's going to be listening to this concert? Who's going to want to come to this concert? So that's a much lighter concert. Uh, it's a, uh, we try to incorporate some pop music as well as light classics, people that, uh, uh, are things that people are familiar with. But there's another aspect of it which I, which I think is often open, overlooked in that what music works outside that, or what music that we normally do inside, like the PAC, where the acoustics are all controlled. We have a shell, we have sound system if mm -hmm. we need it, we have everybody in a great big box. That's not true outside. So if you pick the wrong kinds of, of uh, score, music, uh, music that is scored differently, music that is very delicate, for mm -hmm. instance, you're going to lose it. You know, you're not, you're not going to hear it. So you have to think about the acoustics or the lack of acoustics right. in an outdoor situation and the fact you have to mic things. So there's a lot that goes into that programming, but the first and foremost consideration is what's this audience going to want to hear? And you're absolutely right. That is the most eclectic audience we have <laughs> all year, and we love it. It's amazing. Yeah. 
So what, looking ahead five years or so, what do you hope to see for the Tulsa Symphony? Wow. Uh, but we're always doing our, always updating our strategic <laughs> plan, and it's always five years out there. So, uh, of course, we see greater service to, uh, to the community, be able to pro provide more opportunities like the Guthrie Green, not necessarily on the Guthrie Green. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen with the gathering place. We hope there's a spot for it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've also had a very preliminary conversation with the Botanical Gardens about something happening there. We have one of our education programs right now that's actually in the Oklahoma Aquarium. Uh, yeah, yeah, second semester every year, so uh, we do a joint program with them. So we're always looking for opportunities to get out into other parts of the community and serve those people as well, be very convenient and open to them. Then I see lots more of that. Uh, our chamber program, which we have right up here in the fly lot, uh, has really grown. We sold out, we have three performances every season. Last year, two of them were sold out, and I expect we'll sell out all three of them this year. So that means we're probably looking at adding either a second concert to each one of those, or expanding to a fourth or fifth concert. That's great. Yeah. And, and so with that audience development, um, you know, who is the kind of typical client um, or patron of the symphony? And then who have you been surprised to see starting to really become invested in your organization? Uh, well, I think we, you know, we, we normally think of the traditional, different, the different series have different clientele different audiences and that's why as we can expand those series and we'd love to do like a modern music series mm -hmm. uh, which is maybe a modern you know quite contemporary thing oh, there's that audience out there it's small but we're not serving them at this point so the, the typical the typical audience member varies from concert to concert so the, the more you can put out there the more you can vary your genres and 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 you can attract those other kinds of people uh, the movie's a great example, though. Of mm -hmm. Everybody loves to go to the movies, you know, and, and we would, we've also talked about doing a Friday night at the movie series, where we actually did three or four of those a year. So that audience would, would be served and would have, would have more variety. So uh, different concerts, different audiences, uh, uh, the broader the appeal, such as the movies, the outdoor concert, the, 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 you know, the, the better the distribution mm -hmm. of those audiences. We actually had some of our subscribers when I mentioned that Cox simulcast we did, their seats were empty at the PAC that <laughs> night. They wanted to see what this was going to be like outside and how it worked. So instead of being inside there, they came to this very casual uh, uh, setting for, for that somewhat formal concert. So that was interesting to me. Very good. They want to try other things. Well, we really appreciate your leadership at the Symphony and, you. and your presence in the Brady Arts District has just been so much fun for this neighborhood and for the community. So really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for giving us an inside look at the Tulsa Symphony. Thanks very much. It's been my pleasure. Well, that's our show for today. To learn more about the Tulsa Symphony, check out tulsasymphony.org. And for more information on the Brady Arts District, head to bradyartsdistrict.com. And we'll see you next time on The District.